joy, purpose, gratitude. You are listening to The Brave Files, real stories from people living courageously. You can listen to the show anywhere you enjoy podcasts, and we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does make a difference, and we appreciate it. Now, here's your host, Heather Vickery. Hey there, friends. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of the Brave Files podcast. This is Heather Vickery, and today we are joined by Sapna Shaw. She's the mom of triplets. Y'all heard that right, triplets, and the founder of We Go Kids, which is a company that takes an emotional intelligence approach to everyday parenting. They, they deliver innovative content and products to real parents raising world changers. You all know that that is a serious hot button for me. Sapna struggled with unexplained infertility for 10 years before having her triplets. And then when they were just two years old, she launched this company. She is a pretty brave lady. Sapna, welcome to the Brave Files. Thanks for having me, Heather. (laughs) I'm excited to have you here. We have known each other in the virtual entrepreneurial podcast world for quite a while now, and it's been um, exciting to get to know you, and I've been so looking forward to this interview. Me as well. Okay, so let's talk about, um, let's start at the very beginning. Would you share, um, to your comfort level, your struggles to get pregnant? Absolutely. I'm pretty vocal about it. It because when I was going through it, nobody was vocal about it. And I felt like I was the only person in the world who couldn't have a baby. So I'm happy to answer any and all questions. But we did struggle with infertility for 10 years. You know, the first couple of years, it was just figuring out how to you know, the timing and all that sort of stuff. And then after two years, which is what typically doctors will make you wait before doing any testing. And then we started all of the testing. Uh, That took about a year. The results were all normal. Uh, You know, doctors say, we have no idea why you can't get pregnant. Sorry about that. (laughs) Then they just lay out the medical steps that you can take, uh, which are usually IUI, uh, which means that, uh, well, actually, the first step are, sh- you know, lots of shots and injectables yeah. to increase egg production and things like that. Then the next step is IUI, where the they take the sperm and then medically insert it. And mm-hmm. then when that doesn't, if that doesn't work, then kind of the last and final try is IVF, which is in vitro fertilization, where they take out the eggs and the sperm, they create the embryos outside the body and then implant them back. Right. Okay. So it was, yeah, it's been, it was definitely quite a journey. We, I personally never wanted to do IVF because I felt it was like slamming the door shut to a family if it didn't work. Oh, and there was a lot of fear associated with taking that step. So I'm curious about that. Why did you feel like if that didn't work, you didn't get a family? Well, I couldn't have a baby on my own. You couldn't have your own baby. Uh, so not a yeah. quote unquote traditional family. Correct. Traditional Correct. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. So 10 years of this, does it, were you going through all of these steps, like trying IUI, it's IUI, right? And then IVF, and it wasn't successful before you got the twins? Or what was that process like? Yeah, so we did, um, you know, it it was a couple of years of, of doing the shots, and, and it wasn't consecutive, so it wasn't every cycle we were doing it. We would try it for two or three cycles, and then we take a break. Yeah. Because it's, it's, you ride an emo- a heavy emotional roller coaster during that time every month. I can and only so, imagine. Yeah, and then we went to the IUI, which we tried three cycles of that. And the last cycle, the... <laughs> While I was on the table with my legs in the stirrups and they were getting ready to do the procedure, I realized that they had the wrong person's medical file. Oh my God. How did you figure that out? And how lucky that you figured that out? <laughs> this because is like they were asking questions. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's like they were asking questions and I was like, what these don't make any sense like why are you asking and then they were talking about some history that was not mine 
And so I, I took my legs out of the stirrups and I sat up and they looked at me and they're like, what's wrong? And I said, that's not my file. And I got dressed and I walked out. Oh my goodness. That is, have, have you watched Jane the Virgin? Have you seen it? No, I haven't. Oh my God. It's, a, it's one of my favorite shows. All of you out there, if you like a really good, it, they base it on a telenovela, but that's the basis of the whole thing. She goes in for a pap smear and accidentally gets inseminated. <laughs> <laughs> with somebody else's oh place. my gosh that funny? well it's not far from uh, <laughs> possibly happening <laughs> holy moly well that was pretty lucky yeah so after that um experience uh, i decided to take a year off um i yeah. quit my job i went to work for a yoga studio i did yoga for a year and helped them with their business and then after that is when we started trying again. I actually went the Eastern route, uh, found a really fantastic acupuncturist nice. who had spent 40 years treating women for infertility through acupuncture combined with Western medicine. Right. That's and really so she, it, I mean, it really was, you know, she, she, walked into the yoga studio one day it was just you know it was just the, the timing was right and so I talked to her then I started seeing her for six months and after six months she says okay now you're ready to do IVF wow. and here's who you should go see and so I went to go see the doctor who was a one-man show he was the only doctor in wow. his practice there were only two nurses there they one thing about infertility clinics is that they manipulate your monthly cycle based on their schedule. Oh, that's really so, and, so shitty. And not a lot of people know that. So they manipulate your cycle to go along with their schedule on the days. They do inseminations all on one day. They'll do this all on one day. And you'll notice that they typically will not make appointments on Saturdays or Sundays. So this doctor was completely the opposite. He's like, if you're ovulating on Sunday at 3 a.m., we are here. Wow. So it was uh, really a very different experience. And he was also a very religious man. He was very humble. So he said, you know, I'm the tool. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And if it's not, it's not. But, you know, we can go through the process and see what happens. Wow. That sounds like such a nice way to go into a journey that had been so stressful leading up to that uh, doctors who are like that make all the difference yes it's so true and it really is the only reason why I agreed to IVF was because of him and because of the environment that I walked into when I walked into his office so we ended up uh, doing two rounds of IVF okay. the first round was unsuccessful and then we went straight into a second round it was during the start of the second round that I sat down uh, with my husband and said, you know, we're not, I don't want to do anymore. And the acupuncturist convinced me not to stop in the middle of the cycle because we had already started. Mm. And typically medication will build up on itself in sure. the second cycle. She said, do one more. And if it doesn't work, then you can just stop and be done and decide or not decide what you want to do next. Right. So that was it. Wow. We uh, we had three. We did a fresh cycle, which means we didn't have any use any frozen embryos. We did fresh embryos, and they always put back two embryos. I had just turned thirty five, and I had read that when you turn thirty five, you can request that the doctor put back three because your chances of having a baby or carrying it to full term are getting less and less as your age goes on. And so again, I was on the table, and he said, "We're putting back two, and I said, "No, we're going to put back all three because I'm not doing it again." Right. <laughs> and you did not know what you were asking for. <laughs> I had no idea what I was asking for at all. And um, wow. eight, six to eight weeks later, I, I never took a pregnancy te test. I told the nurses who I had become very close to that you're going to tell me if I'm pregnant or not because I don't want to be alone when I find out whether it's no. good or bad. Yeah. So I went in with my husband and my parents came to and they did a blood they did a blood test and she like screamed at the top of her lungs. Your numbers had to be so high. So pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. What was that 
and she said, you are so crazy. Did they go right into an ultrasound to tell you there were three? Did you find out that day? No, no, we had to wait. Okay. Yeah, so we waited another like? three or four weeks. The ultrasound day? Yeah, when you found out there were there were three babies. <laughs> so I love this doctor. He spent 20 minutes on the baby, which is what we thought we had, one baby, <laughs> and um, spent 20 minutes describing the measurements and everything that the, you know, where the fetus was in the stage of development and like, all of these wonderful things. And then I was looking at my clock because I was on a lunch break. <laughs> oh, wow. And then he, um, he said, okay, so that's it. And then he moved the, the wand and he was like, oh, look, there's another one. <laughs> And I looked at my husband and he's like, oh, you've got two babies. Then he proceeded to spend another 20 minutes on that baby. And then I was like texting my boss saying, okay, I'm going to be late. You know, I'm running, I'm running late. And by the way, you know, I think we're having twins. And he finished with that one, got out the tissues to wipe my belly and then moved it and said, Oh, look, there's another one. Oh, my goodness. Uh, my husband pretty much fell out of his chair. <laughs> and at that point, he said, can you please look for any more first before you tell <laughs> us about the third split. baby? Yeah. And he looked. <laughs> wow. He looked and he said, no, it looks like there are just three. I'm just like, three. okay. <laughs> Oh my yes, goodness. there are just three babies coming, but we, you know, we had no point of reference. We don't have any kids. So after wanting a family for 10 years, somebody tells you, you get three babies. I mean, you hit the lottery. Yeah. You have course. no idea what's about to happen to you. No idea. Yeah. I have wondered if it's easier to have multiple births or babies that are close together, but just far enough that you're doing different things. So my oldest two are 20 months apart, right? But we're still in diapers at the same time, but nap schedules are all, like all of these things. How yes. easy or difficult, I don't know, was it to have three babies? What was it like? I will definitely say like, you know, they're six now. So <laughs> it's, a whole lot easier now like sure. you know you have built-in playmates and everything it's she i mean really the bottom line is the work it's the it's the amount of diapers that you have to change it's the <laughs> amount of times that you have to get up at night it's the it's literally just the number you know the amount of laundry that you have to do sure. it's just the the numbers game but once you're out of that stage those stages and you're, and you move, you know, to where they can put on their shoes and, and buckle themselves in the car and everything, like it becomes a lot easier. So for us, that turning point was about when they turned four, okay. um, we, we felt like, okay, <laughs> it's a little bit easier. We can do this. We're, we are doing this. Good for you. Did you have a good support? We are doing when they were little. Yes, I had, I mean, there, there is no question that the reason my kids are the way that they are is because of the support system that we had. My in-laws moved in with us for six months. My mom, you know, literally since the time I was six months pregnant, because I couldn't drive, sure. but I worked until the day before I had the kids. She would drive me to work every day. And she lived two and a half hours away. So she'd come on a Sunday night. Wow. She'd stay all week, take me to work, take me home. And then uh, once the babies were born, she was here every week. She still comes almost at least every couple of weeks. That's so great. That is so great. Okay. So you birth three babies and then you birth a business. How in the world <laughs> did you make that decision? What brought you to it? And then tell me about We Go Kids. Yeah. So it really was... Um, it, it, People say, why don't you take credit for it? It really wasn't me. It was the universe. There's no question in my mind yeah. that, you know, I had absolutely no intention of starting a business when you have three two-year-olds uh, <laughs> in your life. I had wanted to be a parent for as long as I could remember, and now I had that. So starting a business was like not even in my peripheral vision like it wasn't even anywhere in my brain but one day my yoga teacher 
sent me a Facebook message and she said, I'm looking for some cute yoga kids, yoga clothes for my grandkids. And I can't find any. She spelled out exactly what she was looking for. And she said, maybe you could do something with that. And I laughed and cried because the triplets were all taking a nap. And I was like, oh my God, I just need to get some sleep. And I, for whatever reason, that planted a seed. It, you know, it was definitely my purpose in life that planted a seed. And literally, the resources started showing up at my door. That is amazing. And I never had like a vision for a company. I never had a vision of where it was going. I never even, honestly, I never wanted it. But I know how to follow instructions. So <laughs> as as the resources started showing up, I was like, all right, well, this is, you know, I guess this is the next step. I guess this is the next step. I'll do this one step. And mm -hmm. I never put any pressure on myself to work a certain number of hours a week. You know, I did a lot of um, self-study once the kids were born, uh, a lot of digging into the emotional intelligence, which I had spent 10 years in corporate America studying and applying those principles. And when I had the baby and made that, had the babies and made that shift, it was really a lot of self-study and then observing my own kids. And so I never, I never wanted any of it, but it, it wanted you was my purpose. And so it, yeah. it wanted me. Yeah. Okay, so did you have any background in apparel or clothing, or was it just your emotional intelligence background that that let your boss think of you in this space? I, I can't sew a button. <laughs> Me either. So, <laughs> I had no experience in clothing. When I started my career, you know, 10 years before I had the kid, I started in HR and talent acquisition and the first job I had my boss came to me and said who was the owner of the company he said I I've been reading about this emotional intelligence stuff and it sounds like it's a good thing for employees and we can make a lot of money so can yeah. you learn more about it <laughs> so Smart I started studying it and then yeah and for you know the 10 years no matter what job I went into, that was really my focus when I was in uh, the HR, when I was leading the HR departments was because I saw the impact that it had, not only on the employees at work, but their family lives. And then on the bottom line, how it created stronger teams, how it yeah. made people happier. And I was like, wow, this is, this is pretty cool. And then when I shifted, when I had the babies, obviously they didn't go back to work. I struggled with postpartum de depression. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you had a postpartum depression, but when I went into my OB and said, you know, I think, I think I have postpartum depression, the only question that they asked me was, do you want to hurt your kids? And I said, no. Huh. And she said, well, your only option, medication. I'm like, you're not giving me any other choices? Like there are no other resources or anything? And she said, no. That's ridiculous. And I was like, well, I guess I have to figure, I mean, it was ridiculous. So I was like, well, I guess I have to figure this out for myself. And the catalyst for me was I picked up a book by Michael Singer called The Untethered Soul. Yes. And book. That, that book really triggered for me what I had learned the 10 years that I was in corporate America and then how to now apply it to my own personal life, to the transition from being, you know, a career woman to now being a mom of three kids. And then I was able to shift and really watch my babies. And I realized that they had the most amounts of emotional intelligence from the day that they were born. You know, kids are present and in the moment yeah. they're self-aware, they know what they need, when they need it, they have inner drive, they love to try new things. And so I felt like they're born, our, our kids are born with the highest level of emotional intelligence, and then we parent it out of them. And then we spend our entire lives trying to get back to the place <laughs> we were on the day that we were born. Yeah. And yep. if we shift from a parenting perspective, if we shift to nurturing what they're already born with, that's how we change the world. Yeah. And it was all of those pieces that kind of came together that really 
kind of was a foothold for me. Yoga, you know, has a lot to do with breathing, which has a lot to do with self-regulation, which is a foundation of emotional intelligence. And so the yoga clothing line was just a tool to get me to where I needed to be, which is where I am today and who knows where I'm going. But that's how kind of the yoga clothing line started uh, was because I was teaching uh, the triplets a lot of the the self-regulation techniques and self-awareness techniques. It's very, very cool. Oh, I could really dig in a lot on that, but there's so much more I want to talk with you about. So we have to do a follow up and just talk about the emotional intelligence quote. Okay, so We Go Kids is now a brand. It's more than yoga clothing. Tell us what you've branched into because I think it's all so cool. Yeah, so after the clothing, uh, which we now manufacture uh, on our own, it's 100% organic cotton. It's very sustainably manufactured. They're our own line of animal characters. What I found was when I was talking to parents, there were still a lot of questions. And, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of parenting books out there. And it's like, you know, why are we still not getting it? And the statistics on bullying and obesity and screen time and depression and anxiety, like it's, it's all exponentially increasing. So, so where's the missing piece? And the way it manifested for me was in TV shows, developing really bite-sized, entertaining, interview-based shows that gets across the information that parents need to be able to, I can watch a five to 10 minute segment and then take what I learn and go and apply it in my life. I don't have to read a 300 page book and take notes and then figure out for myself. Like these parents are telling me this is what they do in their lives. And I take the pieces that fit in mine and I can go and use them. That's really cool. So it's for parents to watch and get quick tidbits of things that they can instantly go and take action on. Yes. Yeah. That's really cool. I, I really think that that work is so important. When you said earlier about, you know, the children are born with this and we parent it out and then we try to put it back in. I so resonate with that. I saw a cartoon years ago that I think of all the time and it's happens to be a dad talking to a daughter, a little girl. She's, yeah, it's a cartoon character, but she looks like she's maybe two or three. And he says, I want you to grow up to be strong and powerful and independent and to fight for what you want, but, but just not, not right now. <laughs> like, I just want you to shut up right now and do what I tell you to, right? It's so counterintuitive yes. that we don't raise our children in a way that we want them to be as adults and that we don't recognize yes. um, how smart they are and how in touch they are and how capable they are in so many, many ways, because we, we as parents want to busily rush through and get things done. And there's just an easier, it's not just a better way, but I think an easier way to parent when you tap into this emotional intelligence. I totally agree. I mean, that, that is why I have three six-year-olds and a business and um you know i'm able to volunteer and do do all of the things that i want to do that bring joy to my life you know we homeschool as well but it's because it is a simple it's a simpler life like we we don't you know multitasking i stopped multitasking that was one of the biggest transitions that i made when i became a mom was to stop multitasking such a big deal and i started the gratitude practice Moms think they need to multitask more because they're moms. And really, I think that's yes. more important than ever to stop, to stay focused on one thing at a time, do it really well, and get it done faster. And our society praises us for being multitaskers, right? We don't get any praise for sitting down and giving focused attention to something. How many more things can you do at the same time? That is what we praise. I agree with you, but I think it's shifting. What do you think? There's a lot of conversations. No, I definitely, because of conversations, because Mm -hmm. the parents who don't multitask are now starting to speak up and say, okay, that's one perspective, but here's another one. Yeah. And when people are feeling like they're running the rat race, right? They're kind they're crazy. It's interesting. One of the most interesting examples to me this year is 
for the past several years, and I love to read. I have an English degree. Like I love, love, love to pick up a book. And I have been on the bandwagon of who has time for that? I, you know, I don't have any time. I can't even find five minutes to go to the bathroom by myself, all of these things. And at the start of 2019, I joined a group committed to reading 12 books in 12 months, picking 12 books off of your shelf that have been sitting there for a while and that you really want to read. And I began to build specific time into my schedule. There are two things I changed. One is I built specific time into sit and read. And the other is when I had, I was going to keep my book with me. And when I had just a few minutes and I would normally scroll through social media, I was going to just read a few pages mm -hmm. of the book instead. And I finished my January yeah. book in two and a half weeks and was starting on my February book before the, the month was out, right? Like, and it felt really easy. And also, I was so proud of myself. <laughs> I felt so proud. Yes. Like, I made the time to do something that's important to me, and it feels really good. That is amazing. I shifted my self talk similarly to what you're saying because when I, if I say I don't have time, I shifted to, I choose not to make That's time true. to do it. Yeah, I'm choosing not to, or I am choosing to, either way. Yes. Yes. Matter. Words matter so, yes. so, so, so because much. Because we always have a choice at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's what people who listen to this show regularly, and I know you listen as well, so you may have heard me tell this story, but that's, you know, my nine-year-old who reminded me that I don't need to do anything. She still does. She's been telling me that since she was seven. You don't need to, mommy. You want to. And then she'll yeah. break down why I want to. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> isn't it such a great reminder to have them in our house? My daughter does, you know, the same thing for me. She will just remind me, like, totally within a snap, say something something to bring me right to the present moment. She'll say things like, you're not focused on me, make eye contact with me, hold my hand so I know you're listening to me. Love and that. and it's amazing. That is emotional intelligence at work right there. Yes. Yeah, it's very cool. My littlest one, and I work very hard to be present and to pay attention, but if I'm already doing something, let's say I'm sending an email on my phone or whatever, and they come up, we got to work on you know, I will give you all my attention, but let me finish this thing that I'm doing. But she'll say, put your phone down and look at me. <laughs> okay, yeah, I will. But you interrupted me. So let me finish this. And then I will, I promise you. <laughs> and I have to be really yes. conscious of not, if it's near me, not picking it up in a lull in conversation or a lull in play, because when they look back up, I want them to see me looking at them. Yes. A hundred percent because you're gonna we're gonna want that and and you know as they become as they get bigger and grow into teenagers trust like me. we're really gonna want that so we gotta show them what it looks like now trust me I have a teenager and a preteen and at least <laughs> once a week I have to say why do you have your phone out at the table you know you're not allowed to have your phone out at the table all right so getting back on on topic here. Can you tell me throughout all of this, and you can pick anything from your infertility journey to having the babies to your business, what has been your biggest struggle? I think my biggest struggle was definitely the infertility. I choose not to struggle anymore. Uh, once, once I had the triplets and started um, that self-discovery and, and on my path, I call it on my path to consciousness and really being self-aware and, and everything now, there's nothing. There's nothing. I don't struggle. If I'm struggling, I'm on the wrong, I'm on the right. wrong path. So Stuff that comes was, to me. Yeah. That was going to be my question because people are going to listen and go, is this lady for real? What do you mean? She chooses not to struggle. Everybody no. struggles. That doesn't mean that things don't get difficult, right? Can you, I, what I'm hearing you say, and I think I'm right. Is that when something is a problem, instead of letting it stay a problem, you figure out why it's a problem and you make a different choice. Is that, am I on? Um, point there? Absolutely. It's, you know, for me, it's really about staying aligned um, spiritually, emotionally, physically, mentally. That is my center point. That is my groundedness. And when I am in that space, I always have gratitude. I always have joy. It's not that there's not work. I work my butt yeah. off. But yeah. I love the work. 
And what I found on my path is that when I do start to struggle with something, it's generally not the direction I'm supposed to go. I believe Absolutely. my fundamental belief is that the universe conspires for us. That is my fundamental belief. That is so beautiful. The universe and, conspires for us. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. And when we can really sit in that space and believe that to be a hundred percent true, it kind of alleviates the pressure of anything else. That is so beautiful. And then it removes the struggle. Yeah. It's, it's a practical, tactical way to break down. We have built these societal rules where it's all supposed to be hard. We're supposed to struggle. Oh, it's just life. And yes, what you just shared is, is it's analytical thinking to something that feels metaphysical or mental. Um, there are actual things you can do to shift your yes. situation and your perspective. It is not, it's not woo woo folks. It's not all in your mind. They're real. There are real choices and you get to make them. When I tell you at the end of every show to choose bravely, I mean that choose bravely to not yes. allow yourself to be uncomfortable uncomfortable. I always, I also say everything you want on the other side of uncomfortable, but that's a different thing. That's pushing yourself to do something that you know you can do. Um, but to not sit in pain and to not sit in struggle. So I think that is very cool. I I'm curious throughout all of this for you, Sapna, what has been the most pleasant surprise? That's a good question, Heather. I think <laughs> probably the most pleasant surprise has just been when you, you know, when you look back and see where you started, I started with a Facebook message from a yoga teacher that said this, mm -hmm. and now I am here with a parenting TV network. Uh, we're getting ready to launch a platform that's going to compete with Amazon. What? We are, we are on this path and to go back to the point, none of it was a struggle. I have loved, and I can honestly, transparently, I say it to people's faces, looking them dead straight in the eye, I have loved every minute of the last six years. I have been grounded. I have been the best parent that I could possibly be. I have taken care of myself in ways that I never knew that I needed to. I have prioritized myself. I've just, the last six years or seven years have just been the happiest years in my entire life. And look where I am. Yeah. And it was all, it was work, but I didn't have to struggle. I didn't fight. I didn't cry. Like I sat back and I really enjoyed the ride. What I want to throw out there though, I just want to remind everybody who's listening is that you're very clearly saying in the last six or seven years, this was not always the case. You had to work and learn how to make this your reality. Oh, a hundred percent. It's not, you know, it, like I said, I think we're born with it and then it, it's gone because we live, we live in society and we listen to people, what people say and people come to us. We come to our children with all of our own baggage. You know, we, we think that the world is this way and we want to protect our kids. And so we teach them things a certain way. And so that's what I spent living the first 30 years of my life. And then when I had the triplets, it shifted. And I was able to really study the tools that I needed to better understand not an easier path, but I think for me, the path that was right for me. And that, yeah. and that is really that gratitude and positiveness and some people call it there are a lot of different words for it some people call it, call it a conscious path or consciousness mm -hmm. um but i really just think it's it's the way that we can live happily yeah. in this world do you feel brave every single day of the last seven years <laughs> that is the best answer that is the best answer tell us why I mean, every step of my journey has been 
understanding and overcoming fear. You know, I think that fear comes from our past. Everything that we're afraid of now in our present can be directly traced back yeah. to an experience from our past. Yeah. And that's really the foundation of emotional intelligence is, is figuring out what is it that just happened, the conversation or the circumstance that triggered, that created this emotion, that created this physical reaction but that is actually tied back to something that I haven't dealt with from my past. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you consciously know you step into each day brave. So many people do not recognize that element and there's so much power in that. Yes, it's really acknowledging the work that you are going to put into this day to make it what you want it to be. That's beautiful. Acknowledging the work that you're going to put into this day to make it what you want it to be. It's quotable. It's very good. <laughs> you guys heard, you heard her say that here. We're going to, you're going to see that all over Instagram. Cause that is yes, 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 yes. How do you celebrate your successes and your wins? You're so present in the moment. You're, you, you work to not struggle, which is work to stay conscious and to, to stay in, in the moment. How do you celebrate the big and the little? The first step for me is always gratitude. Yeah. <clears throat> it is always taking that immediate moment to give gratitude for what just happened. Yes, yes, yes. And if it's, if it's something, you know, if it's a small step or a small accomplishment, that is the way that I celebrate. And if it's something really, really big, like, uh, when we launch our platform or uh, I finish my book, then it's probably, get, I'm a foodie, so it's probably going to be a really nice meal somewhere. I love both of those. And I, as all of you know, am very deeply rooted and connected in gratitude. I even noticed that your email signature is gratefully, which the only other person that I've known to sign their emails like that is um, the leader of positive psychology, Robert Emmons from UC Berkeley, which is um, very cool. I, I, it's resonates with me. I see it and I pause and I express mental gratitude. So I love that you have that on your email signature. I love it. Can you tell us, um, as we come to the wrap of the show, a couple of things. One is how folks can learn more about you. Uh, you do still have the clothing apparel, right? There, that does still exist. And then your other platforms, um, and I think you have a podcast. Can you tell us how we can connect with you? Yes, the best way to go, uh, you can go to raisingei.com, raisingei.com. That's where you'll find everything about us. And um, you can, the platform, you can buy our clothing, you'll check out our podcast, uh, our shows are on there that you can subscribe to. Everything is there. Awesome. And what is the name of your podcast? The podcast is called From Me to We. And tell us just quickly about it. So the podcast is the journey that my husband and I have gone through and it's the emotional intelligence approach that we take to raising the triplets. Very cool. So all of you want to know more about this, you should totally listen to Sapna's podcast because you can get all sorts of awesome, awesome insights from that. So my last big question is probably my favorite. And I know it's something that really is deeply rooted in you as well. Can you share with us what your favorite charitable organization is to support? Yes. So my favorite charitable, charitable organization to support is the Mark Wandel Foundation. The Mark Wandel Foundation facilitates support for children in grief. Mm -hmm. They give uh, support and assistance to grieving children who have lost a family member or a guardian. That sounds like a very important organization. Is it local to you or are they national or international? Uh, it, they're their home office is here. It is a national organization. They have um, amazing camps and lots of national resources and different things that can help parents who 
or help, can help families who have a child who's struggling with a recent grief. That is so, so, so important. Loss. As always, you guys, go and check out this organization, learn more about them, like their Facebook page, share it if you have something to contribute financially or time or energy, do that when we come together to support these types of organizations, we work as a community to make the world better and stronger and we cannot do it alone. We have to do it together. Sapna, can you share your three words with us one last time? Joy, purpose, gratitude. They're fantastic words, and I think that we can see and feel all of those from you. Sometimes I need a description as to why you've selected those words, but I think it's all really very clear. I have loved talking to you. Thank you so, so much for being here with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Heather. I loved our conversation. You know, you guys, what I really admire so much about Sapna is the grit and the determination. She is so inspiring. I love everything that you're, you're up to. And the, the notification of the fact that you, you now know, listeners, you now know you don't have to struggle. And listen, I just want to put it aside here. We're not talking about mental health. This is a totally different topic, but it, all things considered, you have choice. You can empower yourself and you get to make a decision on what kind of life that you want to live. And if you have not jumped on the gratitude train yet, this is a really good time to do that. Don't forget that I have a gratitude journal and acknowledging and expressing gratitude has had an enormous impact on my life. So grab this journal so that you can also take this journey. It will enrich your life in so very, very many ways. Until next week, this is Heather Vickery reminding you today and every day to choose bravely and gratefully. Today's show was brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash the brave files and browse their unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title of your choice for free and start listening. It's that simple. Just head to audiotrial.com slash The Brave Files. Thank you for listening to The Brave Files. Be sure to visit thebravefilespodcast.com to access the show notes and discover fantastic bonus content. Music composed and produced by Matt Lewis of Union Music, LLC. Special thanks to our editor and audio mix expert, Andrew Olson. I am eternally grateful for all that he does to make each week sound so fantastic. You can hear more of Andrew's work at findandrewolson.com.